aid is finally starting to arrive in many of the towns hit by Typhoon Haiyan a week ago, but there are still some remote areas which have received no help at all. And the head of the UN humanitarian programme says, I do feel that we've let people down. Well, we're going to speak to survivors and those helping the rescue effort in Cebu, in Manila and in Ilo Ilo City. Plus, we'll be joined by Filipinos here in the UK who are in touch with their family back home. Well, we're here live for the next hour here on World Have Your Say. There are plenty of ways for you to get in touch on Twitter, on email or on Facebook. Well, thank you for being with us here on World Have Your Say. Here live for the next hour. Any comments that you send in to us come straight to my tablet here and we'll put them to any of our guests who are with us. We'll be speaking to uh, people from the Philippines in the UK a little bit later on in the programme. But first, let me introduce you to Neil, who joins us on the line now. He was in Leyte. He's now in Cebu and he survived the typhoon. Neil, welcome to the programme and thank you for taking the time to share your story with us. First of all, take us back by a week and tell us what happened to you. It's been a difficult journey coming back to Cebu. Uh, we spent several days the storm hit um, late at Friday. We were only able to come home Wednesday morning. We were supposed to come back Tuesday afternoon, but the flights were all delayed and canceled because of another storm. So we had the first storm last Friday, and then another storm hit the Philippines. So we um, we didn't really get affected a lot of the second storm, but it canceled a lot of flights, causing further delays and getting back home. It's very difficult to uh, imagine walking through the streets, not having transportation, seeing dead bodies around not even seeing them, you can just smell them. You know, like meters of it, you're going to be passing through dead bodies. And you see people hungry, you see people after your water, and you're passing by with a bottle of water, they will approach and say, can I have that? Or you, you're seen eating, people are going to stare at you, and they're going to look at you, and you're just afraid whether they're going to be asking you, and you don't, you don't have enough, or they're going to be pointing a knife or a gun at you, and they're going to be eating all your food, and it's just... Neil, it's a difficult Skype line that we've got there with your line breaking up, but it's quite clear you explaining to us about the bodies that you had to walk through, the, the smell that just hit you as you walk along the streets. Um, I know that you've put up several photos here on Facebook, um, which we're showing through um, at the moment on the screen there. You can see them. Neil, tell us a little bit about those photos that you took. Well, there were several photos that I took. One was with the, um, what was in the school in Palo Leite. That's where we were at. Um, initially, when I looked out, everything was still good. We thought it's going to be a storm that will pass through and we're all going to be safe. The worst would be losing a few um, sheets of met, uh, sheets of roof uh, sheets uh, and some pots and some plants in the process. We never expected it to be that devastating. I took some pictures initially to show how thick the rain was. It felt like fog rather than rain because there was zero visibility. And the next thing we knew by the time we evacuated and after the storm was done, we looked out and the world was flat. Uh, we saw the real line around, we saw cars over. We went downtown to check if we have mobile signal, and I took some pictures in the process. And it was just weird to see that I, I've been to Tacloban several times. I know it like the back of my hand. Unfortunately, I I get I got lost. I do not recognize the I don't recognize the place anymore. Debris was as high as like 12 feet. Trucks um, on top of cars, and I, I just can't explain it. There are even dead bodies around. When we went through, there was there was still like flood need, um, water was still knee deep in some of the roads, and I didn't know if I was stepping on bodies of people or dead animals or 
plants or debris or cable. We just can't simply determine it. The, the waters were muddy and it was at six o'clock, it's pitch black. We can't even see anything unless you have a flashlight. You still sound quite shaken by what you've experienced. Do you think it's really sunk in yet or do you think you're still, still in shock? When, if you would have asked me a few days when I was still in Tacloban and I was still there surviving, I would have been laughing and joking around. But since we got back to Cebu yesterday, it, it felt weird because when I came in, I said, oh, I'm just hungry. That's the first thing I, I thought, I'm going to eat a lot. I'm going to eat food that's from a restaurant, not from canned goods. We were eating when, while we were there and we ate a lot and then I felt heavy and then my, my boss told me, who was also with me in Tacloban, and he got to leave first because we made him leave through the military plane so he can get us relief, he can get us um, help from Cebu. And when I said, you haven't cried yet, and that's not a good sign. He said, I'm ready to work, I'm, 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 I'm good, I'm, I'm going to help out with the relief. I said, you haven't cried, and that's the first step. And so I said, okay, and then I felt happy later that afternoon. And last night I've been crying and crying, and I just stopped crying this afternoon at around 6, I think, when I last, when I last met with my friends. And so far, it's just weird. It, uh, I, I feel a lot of regret. I, I'm happy I survived. I'm happy I helped. I had, we had around 30 people. There were eight, 30 of us were able to live together. And I'm happy that I was part of was able to help a plan how about 25 people. I was able to help like a middle like a, an, an old guy. I don't know what you call it, but his he has a hole in his throat and that's how he breathed. And he was crossing the flood because he needed to get to a hospital and we stayed with him, but that's it. There could be a lot of a lot of people that we could help. Like just giving like a can of corned beef or sharing our a cup of rice, we could have helped more and it just felt wrong for to be alive and knowing that there are still hundreds and thousands of people there with, with nothing who are getting killed or raped or looted just became a few cans of canned goods and, and a few kilos of rice. They even drink water from the canals and I was pretty lucky that I had the bottled water that had stopped up. Well, Neil, I want to pull up this comment, um, which is an editorial aimed at the government in today's Philippine Star with a cartoon headline, Get Your Act Together. It says the lack of a coordinated and efficient delivery system was compounded by the failure of the government to rein in lawlessness for several days, despite the deployment of hundreds of soldiers and police. Neil, I can see you nodding there. Do you agree with that sentiment? Be very objective. I think the government... Um, needed more time to prepare. Um, I think the government also in the process, but that's from my perspective, not from my, how I see things now, being in, trying to be an outsider and trying to put things into consideration, knowing how people can react and how, and how, uh, and the storm was just unexpected. Everybody was dumping the storm. That's not something I'm surprised, but as a survivor and being there, I was looking at the military for one, they could have done a better job. They could have done um, because the people. There was no clear chain of command. I don't want to. I don't want to put our government in bad light. But the sad thing is, I was there signing up for relief goods at the airport, and I told there were four soldiers helping us, making sure the lines were clear. And then the part of relief came in. The three lines that were there became seven or six. And people at the back, people just came there, just came rushing in. And the the, uh, the people from the government, so those people who cut the line. And I was frustrated, and I said to the to the soldiers from the Air Force, can you please come out there, like 20 of you, instead of cold for compound. You guys are sitting in shade, and they had bottles of water with them, and they were drinking, and they were just standing there, and they had clean clothes. My clothes, of our clothes were dirty and muddy, and then... Yeah, so please just keep us in order. And said, we're not, we don't have relief goods. The, the, the Department of Social Welfare handles that. And I, said, I told them, I don't care if the relief goods are coming. I don't care if you're not in charge. All I want you to do is come here, put us in order. Don't let anyone cut because we've been waiting here for hours just to get five, like four, two kilos of rice and six canned goods and a bottle of water. And that's what we're asking. Just keep us in order. But, but they just stood there. 
there were some of them who I don't know, maybe they panicked or they were afraid of the people lining up that they just murked at me and refused to listen. The other people who heard me stopped me from shouting at them because I was so frustrated. Imagine they were clean, they were they got a bath, their clothes are designed to withstand it. They were trained to be under the sun and we're not to just survive a storm and we're still shaking and we're under the sun. We just walked kilo several kilometers just to go to the airport to get food. And he stopped me and said, they're not going to listen. There could have been some ways we're in, they could have brought, they could have had the convoy. They, can, they had two, several trucks. One could have been filled with relief goods and the other could have been filled with soldiers or they could have walked together with the truck, go to the interior and start distributing food to the to areas out like outside the airport, but most of the food was in the airport. And the sad thing is, a lot of people were selfish. After they got their relief list, they would go back to the end of the line and get another sort of relief list. There was no way to identify whether one has gotten something or not. Um, I agree with several comments from the international media. I was reading through them when I got here. And there was a lot of disorganization. It could have been better. However, I can't blame them. A lot of them are also victims. The military was also affected by the storm, and so was the police force. So like, I, uh, as much as I want to point fingers at them, but I also can't blame the fact that they're also victims like us. Well, Neil, but it was their job. And it's, it's interesting that you say that, Neil. We have um, had so many people getting in touch with us on World Have Your Say saying, it's just survival instinct now. As you say, you're annoyed that people got their relief goods and then we're rejoining the queue. But if they're hungry and they're desperate for their family, we're hearing these stories coming in on World Have Your Say. Thank you for joining us, Neil. So many people getting in touch with us. Worth saying as well, we did ask the ambassador, the Philippines ambassador to the UK to come on the programme. Unfortunately, he declined. And also the organisation um, sorting out the relief effort in the Philippines, they were unable to join us as well. Lots of you getting in touch with us here on World Have Your Say. Isho in Japan called in to say there's two too much politics in disaster aid. The relief effort should be paramount and we should ignore politics. If you want to get in touch, the hashtag is WHYS on Twitter. Lots more to come. Do stay with us. No, I am talking about it. Change. Oh, let me say something. No, I am talking about it. Change. Oh, let me say something. Welcome back to World Have Your Say. I'm joined by some Filipinos here in the UK. Amy is with us, Renee, Renee. and also Elisa. Elisa's phone just went off. You quickly grabbed it and managed to turn it off. So well done. That was quick action. I know, Amy, you wanted to pick up on what Neil was saying uh, just before the break when he was talking about aid and how it's being dealt with. Yes, yes. I was just, hi, Renee. I mean, hi, Neil. Um, I was just talking about the, um, the disorganizations of our government. Uh, you were saying about the, uh, you know, there's, there's quite a lot of news um, about the disorganizations, you know, the, the relief are not going to the, the people that needs most. Um, my question is, do we, have, uh, do we have the government there now or do we, do we have our soldiers there now or are we waiting, you know, are we just waiting for the international aid to come and our soldiers are not there to help our people? Based on my estimate, we have approximately around 200 soldiers there from both our forces, the military, and the Bureau of Fire Protection. I'm seeing members of the Bureau of Fire Protection going around the city and clearing it up. I'm seeing um, patrols done by the military. However, they're not, uh, they're not handling the, the food distribution primarily because according to some people I've talked to, it's the Department of Social Welfare and Development who is in charge of the food distribution. I so they're primarily there to keep peace in order. Sorry, forgive me, Neil. I was just going to say there are reports in the Philippines media today saying that in actual fact, some soldiers handing out the aid are asking which way people voted in the elections before giving out the aid. Whether this is true or not, I don't know, but it's certainly being reported. But, but ex exactly, because even, even in Facebook, even in Twitter, you know, there are as well putting, you know, all these politicians' names on the aid and, you know, in the aid bag that, that they're distributing. And there's also, you know, um, reports that the, uh, the goods that's coming from international relief are, um, um, are re replaced by a, a national goods you know those um, instead of instead of corned beef now it's going uh, they're going to give it sardines you know those kind of things and I would just like to I, because you're there Neil I just like to know are, are those true you know on behalf of our viewers are those 
uh, those uh, news are true, that they are actually replacing those goods? So far for the Tacloban, uh, for the, the Tacloban relief goods, um, it was all marked with the SWD um, plastic bags. It, I, I've heard about it too, but not, not, in, not in Tacloban. Alice, you wanted to say something. Yes, well, I see it on, on my Facebook. Um, a relief that was, there's a label there that is, a, you know, the name of the most prominent um, second in command. Um, I don't know if it is just fabricated for the sake of Facebook, you know, uh, Facebook thing, but how true is that? I'm sorry, I wasn't able to get um, the first part of the question, sorry. Elisa was simply saying that she's seen photos on Facebook of politicians' faces being placed on the aid, and she's wondering if you've seen that and, and names of politicians. So far, no. I haven't seen any of the, uh, any of the politicians' names. The sad thing with Leite is that we hardly get politicians. I, the last time I was, the only politician that I remember going there, what made it uh, that everybody went through the city hall was the president, and that's it. Um, I've read on Facebook that Mar Rojas was there, but um, I didn't hear anything from my neighbors about it. And when you were asking people, they weren't there too, so I can't really protest. Okay. And Neil, I am from Giwan. My name is Rene. Uh, is the food parcel that is being distributed in your place, is it enough? The food that co that's coming, are they enough? Because the report of uh, my former ex -may, uh, my former mayor in Giwan, she said to me that uh, we need food, food, more food, because even the parcels that are being distributed apparently are not enough. It's only good for one person for one day. Right, let me just clarify when we talk about distribution. The reality is there is only one known distribution area, and that's the airport. And the airport is kilometer, uh, and my place is is around 10 kilometers away from the airport. If I pass through one road, mm -hmm. if I go through the other road, it's around 14 or 16 kilometers. So a lot of us, and I have uh, friends who live far, uh, who are farther away from me. I mean, I'm from Palo, and then Taklovan is the next city. So I have to walk that far to get goods, and a lot of people are walking with me to get that far. There has only been one known distribution in the interior, or downtown Tacloban, and that is at the uh, city hall during the president's visit. And as for the rest, we have no news, because when we ask people, like, where do we get food? It's always at the airport, airport, airport. That's first. Second is, we get around two kilos of rice, and six canned goods. It's a combination of corned beef and sardines. Now, if we based on, on, on our diet, what we did was do food rations and eat twice a day. The two kilos of rice and the corned beef would be enough for one family to last a day. The sad thing is water. There is a constant delivery of rice and canned goods, but when I was lining up there, I did not receive water. The people that were able to receive water were either getting the five liter water, that's really, that's gonna last us for a day or two. Some were getting two small bottles of 250 ml or 500 ml water. Some of us didn't get. What I did was I went inside the airport and there was a stash there of water that was undistributed and I had to beg, I told, I, caught, I talked to the policeman and said, you have a lot of water here, can I get uh, a gallon? He said, they asked around and said, okay, you can get one. So that's how I got my water. A lot of people are not as lucky or as, as observant to know where the stashes are, but there's a lot of food at the airport coming in. You it's not getting to, if you're from Giwan, Ginan, it's a, I Giwan. Think that's a, a few thousand. I'm from Giwan. Yeah. A Giwan, that's in Samar. Yeah. yeah. I'm not familiar with one the of the most badly hit so place, yeah. Mm. Uh, Neil, you mentioned that your place is very far from the airport. Uh, in Giwan, we have the same situation. All the relief goods are in the airport. But uh, we are lucky because we have so many volunteers, both international and local, foreign and national volunteers. And so the distribution of the goods 
are able to function very well. I mean, uh, I was told by our former mayor that even the remote islands of Suluan, uh, Humonhon, uh, Manikani, Tubabao, they have already been reached so far, and three waves of aid have already been uh, distributed to them only because there are so many volunteers. Do you have the same volunteers in, in your place? Have you got enough volunteers to bring the food from the airport to your place? Or is it the problem? We have several, we have several volunteers, both, um, but right now the, the influx of people coming in are primarily people looking for their families. We have seen some, uh, I've seen volunteer, like French doctors, I've seen volunteers of South Korea. I was able to witness the landing of the U.S. Marines plane and they were helping out in the distribution of goods. However, I'm, I wasn't able to see them going further because the Sloven is scary. Right now, there are news that they're coming out and people are locking their doors. Even in our evacuation center, we had to barricade the stairs and make sure, not, uh, to make sure people don't just simply come in because we have prisoners up about in the city. We have people, uh, we, we've heard that there are people from the New People's Army or rebels coming down and going to going to the city so there's a really there's a huge security risk so it would be very difficult it's very uh, it's 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 going to be very dangerous for volunteers to go into the interior part of the city not to mention that there's still dead bodies lying around that is contaminating the water or contaminating the air it's just going to make you vomit if you're a few meters away from it so it's pretty difficult yeah. Uh, all right, on this uh, food packet, though they have even just a little bit, few pieces of paracetamol or medicine, because medicine is as important as the food. They maybe have been able to eat, but they're very ill. Is there any, any medicines there at all? To be exact, what they get from the SWD okay. with the relief goods, Two kilos of rice, around six, I'm not, I'm not sure if I've got the numbers right, six, seven cans of corned beef and sardines oh, gosh. and water oh. if there's no medicine at all. I came, I myself is from Balanhiga. My hometown is not being mentioned at all. It's just like one of the forgotten town. And as what I have uh, heard, I just phoned up uh, a town mate of mine before I left to the studio and she was saying because i was asking for a feedback and it is only at this very moment that it's uh, the uh, the relief from the private people no, no, none of this highly publicized relief food or whatever it is coming from cebu and it it seems in few hours five hours time will be arriving balanhiga that is balanhiga eastern well, summer Lisa, we spoke to renee on mm -hmm. monday's program and he was telling me where he was from was forgotten mm -hmm. so let's hope in time where you're from won't Nothing. be forgotten yeah. if you've got any questions for any of our guests or indeed for neil you can use the hashtag whys or facebook.com forward slash world have your say we'll carry on talking in the next few minutes let's just say something Welcome back to World Have Your Say. Well, we're talking to Filipinos here in the UK, getting their experiences and their conversations online. We're also speaking to Filipinos who are in the area hit by Typhoon Haiyan a week ago. We're going to be we're joined by Neil, who um, is still with us. He is a Typhoon survivor who was in Leyte, now in Cebu. Also joined by Sandra Borgetta, who was born and raised in Tacloban City and is now currently studying in Seoul. Still with me here is Elisa Ray. Renee and Amy. But first of all, let's pull up this um, interview. It's the Philippine Interior Minister, Mar Roxas, who spoke to the BBC in Tacloban. Imagine a situation from ground zero where on day one, you have to set up the mechanisms to feed, clothe, shelter 275,000 families. 
in a situation where everything, including the social structures, the governance structures, were swept away. Is, is that why the relief effort has appeared to be slow to yes. get moving? Yes. I mean, uh, in, in a situation like this, nothing is fast enough. But you have to understand that the first and second layers of first responders were literally, literally swept away. They themselves were victims. And there's been a lot of criticism about those comments made by the Interior Minister. Sandra, I'll cross to you, get your thoughts on that. Do you think it's fair, the criticism that he has received? Um, I really think that the local government itself has prepared for, for the disaster. They have evacuated people who were living in the coastal areas. It was just a matter of um, actually defining what a storm surge was, because people didn't really expect what, what a storm surge was. They didn't have a concept of, of what it was. So um, people from the from from those that are, are um, in, the, in the subdivisions, for example, those who are away from the coastal towns, they did not expect that it was going to be that strong. And, and we have to understand that even the United States weather, weather forecasters say that um, high-end strength was a Category 7. And in the United States, they only have five categories. So imagine how strong it was, how unexpected it was. So in my view, I really understand the kind of how, how the government has been overwhelmed dramatically by um, by what Haim was Haim has done to Afloban. Um, like I think it has been mentioned also earlier that um, even even the local government themselves are victims of this. And and so I, I think that um, even with the national government taking over, it's 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 really um, a gig gargantuan pact. And um, uh, I really side with the government in this, but I I I think that a lot has still need to be done. So I I, I choose to just sort of partner with the government and try to help them find their way through through the rubble, literally. And um, but I, hopefully it's picking up. Um, so, so many improvements have been done. Um, and I'm really hoping that in the next few days it's going to get faster and, and the aid is going to reach more people, especially in the far flung areas where, uh, far flung areas, far from Tacloban, um, the, main, the main source of where, where, the, where the relief goods are being dropped off. Do you think it's fair criticism or do you understand what Sandra's saying about supporting the government? Well, for me, for, for me is um, you know I think I think okay it's it's a fair criticism in that, that the local government um, cannot help you right now because they also have been affected. But I was wondering about our national government because obviously you know, it takes this is now the sixth day of 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 the disaster, and until now you know there are a lot of people you know crying for help, crying for food, and they saying that they survived for the typhoon, but they are not surviving for for the hunger, for the disease that they're, they're, they're suffering right now and I mean common sense prevail I mean for food we have helicopters you know can can't we not get helicopters you know can we not borrow private helicopters to drop foods on there I mean that's common sense we know that road we cannot go into the road but what happened to helicopters what happened to airplanes we do have some those I think I mean, unless so you think airdrops would make a significant difference? It would at this make stage. a significant um, um, for for those people that you know you cannot That's access damage. through by road, especially the remote areas. You know, and they are now dying there because they don't have food. They survive, but they do not have food. So it, it's it's increasing the the the, the casualty, the, the fatalities is, is increasing every day because of lack of food. So. You know, I can I can sympathize with the local government. Yes, they are affected as well. But we have the national government in Manila who could mobilize those things, you know. And I wonder why, what's happening. And it breaks our heart in here in the foreign land because we cannot even go there. You know, we'd love to help you guys, you know. I mean, we eat in here and we, I, we cannot even eat our food because we're thinking of you. Yeah. And it's really, really depressing for us, you know, especially that we have all these social medias, listening to the news, you know, looking all these photographs, mm -hmm. especially the children, you know, killing each other for just a small amount of food. Correct. And, you know, please, you know, the government, our national government should help. And it's, it's I, I do agree with that because on the first day after the typhoon, I was kind of uh, in disbelief that mayors of coastal towns along 
Eastern Samar, mm -hmm. especially in the southern part of Samar, like the mayor of Hiporlos, he had to leave his people, he had to leave his stricken town to go to Tacloban in order to ask for help. Okay. I mean, officials were leaving their towns in order to ask for help because there was no communication at all. Electricity was cut off, the telephone lines were cut off. My own former mayor in Giwan, she had to travel all the way to Manila with the help of some people who had private planes. She reached Manila and she sent me a message on Facebook saying, this is the only way I can get help, by coming to Manila personally and bringing to people the plight of Giwan Eastern Samar. If Tacloban has had this problem of being inaccessible, inaccessible when you are supposed to be more centered than mm. Giwan or the rest of the towns mm. that were struck by the typhoon, how much more the little islands that well, have been cut off completely. Let's put some of these questions. I'm pleased to say that Justin Morgan, who's country director for Oxfam in the Philippines, joins us now. So maybe we can put some of those questions to him. Justin, welcome to World Have Your Say and thank you for joining us. We were just discussing just before you arrived why airdrops aren't taking place. Lots of frustration, lots of people getting in touch with us on World Have Your Say, saying why isn't that happening? Could you clear that up for us? The situation is very, very difficult to ask. Uh, still at the moment. I mean, our staff were there uh, today and just getting access to the helicopters and finding the places in which they can actually drop food is, is very difficult. It is still raining in many parts there and so it is difficult for the helicopters to fly. There is still strong winds because we've got another tropical storm around. But it is also the places to, to drop the food. So it is a possibility but the roads are opening up and we need to make sure this is where things should be prioritised, I would suggest. And particularly now that the UN is here and they've rated this as their highest possible classification, that should mean rapid investment into to the clearances. It should mean that there is investment, more investment into alternative ways of uh, transportation. As, as has been said, we are an island nation here the boats are also a good possibility. In Giwan, uh, the Red Cross initially were having problems with volunteers and they were especially asking for local volunteers who knew the terrain of the place, who knew the ins and outs of the roads because they were impossible. I think that that will be a big help if you will be able to get local people who exactly know how to get through impossible roads. We are used to that anyway. And with them helping, we would be able to reach those unreachable uh, villages and towns. I support that uh, tremendously. Uh, as an organizer, as Oxfam, we have been here for, for 25 years in the Philippines and we partner with national organizations. It is our staff, our national staff and those organizations that were there first with, with other organizations. It was the Filipinos that have been responding quickest and using all means of transport, the, the tricycle, the, the motorbike, the jeepneys, these are all being utilised at the moment to get food out and to get the to get water into to the people who need it most. They are using some of the local volunteers. When I say local, I don't mean people who are staff staff members of Oxfam. I mean local volunteers who are just from the place who know exactly the place. And in Giwan, they are using them like uh, guides. To, to lead them to places where they can go and where villages are because they know even if the road is impossible, they would find ways and means to go to that place. I, I agree. Uh, as Oxfam, we are partnering with some of the, the companies that are actually been affected. And so they have staff that are no longer able to do their full-time work and sometimes I've allocated them for exactly that reason, to make sure that these people know the local terrain, they know the authorities, they know the people, they know who are the most vulnerable, and they are getting us to the right places as quickly as possible. So I really do support what you're saying about the, maximizing the use of the local knowledge that does exist. 
Well, I want to introduce a new guest now. Franklin joins us from Elo Elo City. Franklin has actually been out to some of the devastated areas today and collected some film. Franklin, tell us what you've seen today. Yeah, uh, we, I went to Estancia, it's the northern part of Ilo Ilo, and I saw a lot of uh, houses that were being destroyed. And actually right now, um, most of the people there are repairing their houses. But uh, for those who doesn't have enough money to build their house yet, they still staying at the evacuation centers. And also, uh, uh, yesterday, the Canadian Air Force carry equipment and some 43 members of the rescue team arrived in Ilo Ilo to help and uh, the Vice President of the Philippines also arrived here in Iloilo City to check and uh, assess the damage that brought by the Typhoon Haiyan. And uh, also the donations from private individual businesses and organizations here in Iloilo uh, were pouring in uh, Estancia and uh, most of the places also there already received uh, their relief goods except for those remote areas where, uh, where the volunteers cannot access yet. So Franklin, what have you made of the government's reaction to this crisis? You say the vice president's been there today. Yeah, uh, he, uh, actually the, the, the local government here in Iloilo are quite fast in acting because the city uh, was not that affected compared to those uh, in the 5th district, that's the northern part of Iloilo. And so with that, uh, the local government immediately uh, respond to the needs of those people uh, in the northern part. So uh, I believe, I, I guess, um, the uh, the effort of the government here in Iloilo are much appreciated by those people who are affected because it's quite fast, and uh, with the, with the help also of the international uh, people, uh, I think uh, Iloilo can recover in not in a lesser time. I wonder, Justin, um, from Oxfam's point of view. How are, how are you getting to areas that are off the radar, if you like? Elisa was saying earlier on where she's from is not even mentioned. She feels like it's been totally forgotten. How can you target those areas? The media is focused on a, on a few areas that were hardest hit by the, the original, uh, by the start of the typhoon and also where they, were, they had the, the highest sea surges. But there are organisations such as Oxfam out into these other areas. As we were discussing before, it's about the, the local relationships as well to, to get to those. Because we, we really do believe that it is often the people at the, the, the far reaches or the ones at the back of the queues are the people who are often the most vulnerable to this um, and they have the least mechanisms to support themselves. And so we are prioritising and getting into those areas. Justin, thank you. Also, thank you to Franklin. Lots more to come on World Have You Say. Lots of you getting in touch with us from around the world. Papa in Kampala has tweeted us saying, why has China donated so little? That is a criticism that we've seen coming in here on World Have You Say. David in the UK has tweeted saying, should the UK and other countries not be looking after their own country and their needs before helping aid efforts like the Philippines? Your thoughts welcome as ever. Facebook.com forward slash World Have You Say. And we'll carry on talking in the next few minutes. No, I, I, I absolutely talking about it. Yeah, oh, let me say something. No, I, I, I absolutely talking about it. Yeah, oh, let me say something. Welcome back to World Have You Say. Lots of you getting in touch with us from all around the world. Mauritius, South Africa, Saudi Arabia, the UK, Japan and Pakistan do keep getting in touch. We've got about 10 minutes of the programme left. And uh, Rene, I was talking to you earlier this week on our radio edition of World Have Your Say and at that stage you didn't know if all of your family were safe. Yes. Have you managed to locate them? Thankfully, yes. All my family members have been accounted for. But at the moment, uh, together with all my cousins from around the world, from Canada, America, Madrid. We're trying to get them out of Giwan because they have expressed to us their fear for their lives and fear for their health. Because there is widespread uh, rumor uh, that there are people going into homes at night and getting whatever they can get, uh, practically stealing uh, food, clothing, and it's making them feel so insecure in the evenings. It's, and uh, also because of what happened, uh, dead bodies being uh, collected 
much later than should have been. Uh, they are afraid that there will be a spread of disease so soon. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to get them out. In fact, uh, Annalisa Gonzalez, the former mayor of Giwan, she sent a message to me this morning, and she was saying that the queue of people at the airport trying to get out to go to Cebu is just long. And today, according to her, the cargo plane that left back for Cebu was loaded with something like 35 or 36 people uh, wanting to leave the country, not the country, leave the, the place for their own security. And even in Tacloban, last night I was with a few of our friends in the Samar Leyte Association, and they were saying that everybody wants to leave the place. And, and Amy and Elisa, you were both saying as well about the issue of rape is yes. now emerging. Yes, yes, yes there's yes. rumours about the rape apparently during the night time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, the vulnerable children and, and women, you know, they're afraid of their lives because, you know, this is the rumours. And I think because of the prisoners apparently, there's mm -hmm. prisoners or, you know, some... some yeah, yeah there was those, a those ones. So they are now afraid to, to go out at night or sometimes they barricade themselves in whatever mm -hmm. place that they are in just to make sure that, you know, these people are, cannot go, go into their, you know, to their little home. Mm -hmm. Justin Morgan, the country director for Oxfam in the Philippines, and Neil, who's a survivor who was in Leyte, now in Cebu, still with us. And Neil, I believe you've got a question for Justin. <laughs> You know, not really a question, but let's talk about the airdrops and such. Now, you mentioned earlier about not being familiar with the terrain and eating the locals. There are a lot of locals who are willing to help if there's just a way to publicize it. If the government needs our help in order to determine where, which areas to drop, uh, uh, to drop the, the supplies, we can actually provide it. As a matter of fact, the Leyte IT Park, which is still under construction, that's a huge space. You've been seeing government helicopters land there and every hour we have the military helicopters circling the area which if they would have used the fuel in a much better way they could have brought goods with them and dropped it off or sent over an advanced military well neil like i just want to jump in i hope you'll forgive me because we're right up against the end of the program i want to give justin the opportunity to respond it, it is Airdrops are, are possible, and, and that is accepted. They are very expensive, and we should acknowledge that. And also, we need to be understand that it does not always mean that the most vulnerable get access to the resource. It is a, it is a possibility, though. It is acknowledged. But we also should look at... This is, this is one aspect in the case of food, where you can get some level of food in there. But in order to get water supplies and, and rehabilitate the infrastructures so that things actually can work at a, a sustainable level, uh, even in these times, there's absolute uh, priority to get, get uh, and rapid response. And, and airdrops just don't work for those types of things. Justin, I hope you'll forgive me for jumping in. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but I have to say goodbye for this edition of World Have You Say. Thank you to all of my guests. You can switch over to World Service Radio and join me in a little over two hours' time. I'll bring you more on this story from the Philippines. You can, of course, add your thoughts at facebook.com forward slash world have you say. Thanks for your company. I'll speak to you again at the same time next week.